If God wrote you a letter, what do you think it would say? Do you think it would be positive? Do you think it would be negative? If God wrote Fellowship Baptist Church a letter, what do you think it would say? Well, the reason why I ask those questions is because today we're going to look at the first of seven letters that Jesus wrote to seven churches. Technically, he didn't write them. He had his apostle John write them. John, he dictated to John what to write. And he had these letters sent to these seven churches. And these letters are found in the book of Revelation. So take your Bible this morning, turn to Revelation chapter 2. And when you hear Revelation, I'm sure the first thing that comes to your mind is not letters from Jesus. Probably what comes to your mind is the apocalypse, the end of the world, doom and gloom and judgment. And that's true. That is found in the book of Revelation. But in the first three chapters, what we find are seven letters that Jesus had written to the churches of Asia Minor. Those are found here in chapters 1 through 3. And last week we saw how what's going on here is dear church. The church is near and dear to Jesus' heart, and he has some messages that he wants the church to hear. And so we're going to look at the first one today, found in chapter 2, verse 1, where uh, Jesus says, To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Now right out of the gate, there's some confusing things. Right, Verse 1, He who holds the seven stars, and he who, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. What's going on here? Well, last week we saw how Revelation is a prophetical book, and most prophetical books include something called symbolism. And most of the time when we see symbolism, we get a little confused. We don't know what's going on. But last week we saw how in verse 20 of chapter 1, uh, these, are, these symbolisms, these symbols are explained. It says in chapter 1, verse 20, The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands the seven stars are the angels of the churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Okay, so that cracks the code right there. What are the seven golden lampstands we saw last week? Those are the seven churches. What are they? Uh, if you go back to verse 11 of chapter 1, uh, write these things to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Those are lampstands are pictures of the seven churches. Now there's another part that we didn't talk about last week. He says, I am, Jesus says, I hold the seven stars in my hand. What is that? Well, in verse 20, he says, those are the angels of the seven churches. Well, what's that mean? Do we have an angel here at Fellowship Baptist Church? I can tell you I'm not an angel. Uh, Pastor Bob He's definitely, he's, he's wagging his head. He's saying he's not an angel. What is an angel? Well, the word angel in Greek, angelos, could be translated as messenger. That's all that word means. Sometimes it's a heavenly messenger, and sometimes it's a human messenger. So if you were to look at, uh, let's see, Luke chapter 7, verse 24. I'm going to have you turn there real quick. Um. I, I'm not going to have you flip around much, but I think this is important to see. In Luke chapter 7, verse 24, it says, When the messengers of John had departed, he began to speak to the multitudes concerning John. That word messengers is the same word used in Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. Angelos, angels. Did John the Baptist have angels? Well, he did have messengers. And so that's what it's talking about there. In James chapter 2, verse 25, if you're taking notes, there's another uh, time in the New Testament where this word is translated as messenger. And so what I believe is going on here is that Jesus is talking about the, the churches, but he's also talking about their pastors. Okay? The messengers. What does a messenger do? Delivers a message. That's all I am here to do. I'm here to deliver a message. To take God's word 
and to share it with you. I'm just a mailman. That's all I am. And that's who Jesus is speaking to. So what people do is they say, okay, there's Revelation is full of symbolism. So if the lampstands are symbolic and the Angels are symbolic, or the stars are symbolic. Then Ephesus has to be symbolic. And if you look in verse 8, he writes to Smyrna. That has to be symbolic. And then if you look at verse number 12, Pergamos, that has to be symbolic. Don't go too far with the symbolism, okay? If there's symbolism in the Bible, it will tell you. The majority of the time, symbolism is explained. It's pointed out. So what some people do is they'll say that each of these seven churches represents a different time period in church history. That is not the case. Okay? Don't go down that road. Symbolism is not found under every rock and under every word in the Bible. Sometimes the Bible does use symbolism, but don't go crazy. All right? I just want to... Get that straight before we dive in. Ephesus was a real place. It had, a, it had real people. And it had a real church. And so this message, although it does include some symbolism, Ephesus is not symbolic. So let's dive in. And let's think about this town called Ephesus. Ephesus is actually a very famous city. Have you ever heard of the seven wonders of the ancient world? Any of you have? The seven wonders of the ancient world. Ephesus had one of those wonders. You probably know one of those wonders actually survives to today. The the pyramids of Egypt, that was one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. And it didn't just have one of the seven wonders of the world. It had the most important. So I have a quote here uh, that's going to show up on the screen uh, by a, a historian from that time period. And he said this, I have set eyes on the wall of lofty Babylon on which a road for chariots, on which is a road for chariots, and the statue of Zeus by the Alpheus and the hanging gardens and the Colossus of the sun. So he's talking about these seven wonders of the world that historians write about and that people envision and, and think about and dream about. And then he says at the end, but when I saw the house of Artemis that mounted to the clouds, those other marvels lost their brilliancy. And I said, lo, apart from Olympus, the sun never looked on aught so grand. Okay, that's very verbose. But what is he saying? He's saying that this house of Artemis also called the Temple of Diana, was the greatest. It was the most wonderful of all the seven wonders of the world. Do you know where the Temple of Diana or the House of Artemis was located? It was located in Ephesus. And that's uh, the place where Jesus writes this letter. But he doesn't just write it to the city of Ephesus. He writes it to the church of Ephesus. So let's think about a little bit of background of this church. Take your Bible and turn to Acts chapter 19. The Bible is so interesting because it it explains itself. In the book of Acts, we we see the history of the early church. And in Acts chapter 19, it, it, it explains how the Apostle Paul came to Ephesus and how he began to... Uh, um, teach and to preach the gospel to the people there. And he was actually there for two years. Uh, He started by going to a synagogue. And after a while, uh, some of the people in the synagogue didn't like what he had to say. So he went and taught in a school. And he almost taught like, he almost had like a seminary or a Bible college in Ephesus. Many people became Christians in Ephesus, which is a very interesting thing because Ephesus was an extremely pagan city. So we talked about the Temple of Diana. Diana was a fertility goddess. And this temple brought in all kinds of people from the region. It was almost like a tourist town. So uh, tourism is big in the Middle East, right? In the Holy Land. 
all kinds of pilgrims, religious pilgrims go there. And Mecca in uh, the Middle East is a big tourist town because that's where a lot of Muslims go for their pilgrimage. Uh, Ephesus was very similar. It was a place where uh, religious pilgrims would come and they would worship this goddess of Diana and they would, in worshiping her, they would do all kinds of terrible, wicked sexual acts. There were temple priestesses that were basically prostitutes that people would um, worship Diana with, for lack of a better way of saying it. Many people in Ephesus, through Paul's ministry and the other disciples' ministry, they repented of that sin, and they were born again out of that pagan, idolatrous culture, and they became Christians. And it, it actually says in Acts chapter 19, beginning in verse 18, this is talking about the people of es Ephesus. Many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. What's amazing about this city of Ephesus is that even though it was pagan and wicked and idolatrous, the gospel thrived in this town. And God used the Apostle Paul, he used the gospel to save people out of this wicked culture, and they became Christians. Uh, the, the transformation was so amazing that they even brought their old occultic materials and they burned them. I, I don't think you, I, I don't know if we can totally comprehend what they were saved out of, what kind of wicked culture they were living in. But what happened was so many people began to get saved and to begin to be transformed and born again. It tells us later in the book of Acts chapter 19 that it impacted this religion of Diana. And some of the people who were making money off of the temple, they didn't like that because it meant they didn't have as much money. And so they began to persecute the Christians there in Ephesus. That's a little bit of the background of this church. It really is amazing to uh, think about how Back then, and even in, in some cultures today, God allows his light to shine, and he transforms people. And so, let's continue looking in Revelation chapter 2 and see more of the background of what Jesus says. He says in Revelation chapter 2, verse 2, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered, and have patience, and have labor, labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Jesus starts his letter off by giving us positive things. He had some very good things to say about this church in Ephesus. There are three words that are, that are what I call key words to these verses because they're repeated so often. The first word is found in verse 2. It's the word works. Now, as you look through verses 2 and 3 and, and even following uh, in later verses, you'll see that that word works or synonyms of that word are found. So the next word is he knows their works. He knows their what? Labor. You see that word there? Labor. And then in verse 3, he says, and you have, what? Labored for my name's sake. That word labor that's used a couple times there is, is the word for uh, work, hard work. I think it's interesting that here we are celebrating Labor Day weekend, and that's the text that we happen to be falling in, where Jesus commends them for their labor, their hard manual labor. Uh, another word that's used here for labor is the word for toil or difficulty or working so hard that you grow weary. And so this church, number one, is 
a church that worked hard. If you were going to uh, describe the church of Ephesus, they were a work-hard church. They ministered uh, to the point of exhaustion. Secondly, another word is repeated. He says, I know your works, your labor, and your patience. And we see synonyms of that word patience several times in these verses. He says, I know your patience. And then he says in verse 3, and you have persevered. And he says it again, you have patience. See that repeated over and over again? The word, one of the words for patience is, in the Greek is the word hupo meno. It means to remain under. Actually, the, the first part is under, and then the second part of the word is remain. It's almost like I, I envision like a, a, a weightlifter who's lifting a heavy bar of weights, and they're under that weight, and it's so heavy, and it's... It's just killing them, but they're remaining under that weight. Maybe you've seen some Olympians do that. And they're shaking with all their might. They're sweating. That's almost what the picture that you see here. In verse 3, it uses the word persevere. That word means to bear up under. And in some translations, it would use the word in other contexts as to bear the cross. So, number one... This was a work-hard church. Number two, this was a die-hard church. Uh, I've had to replace several batteries in my vehicles over the years. Not fun. I don't like doing it. Number one, because it costs so much. And number two, because sometimes it's, it's not as easy to take the old battery out and put the new battery in. But anyway, sometimes I would get a die-hard battery. Have you guys ever seen die-hard batteries before? What's a die-hard battery? A die-hard battery is uh, a name brand, I guess. Maybe it's not a name brand. I don't know. Uh, But it's it's a battery that perseveres, that goes through extreme uh, circumstances and lasts and lasts and lasts. And that kind of is a picture of how this church was. They worked very hard, and they didn't stop. They persevered. They went through a lot of persecution a lot of opposition, and they just kept going and going. They didn't give up. And Jesus commends them for it. Thirdly, there's a third word that's repeated, and or a third concept, I should say, that's repeated. And this, it's, a, it's an idea of fighting, fighting the good fight. He says in verse 2, You cannot bear the works or bear those who are evil, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. So this church didn't just accept any old person coming in teaching them. They didn't just accept any doctrine. They weighed it out. They were discerning. And if false doctrine was being taught, they they would get rid of it. They would stop it. It says later on in the passage in verse 6, This you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. They were a church who opposed false teaching. Um, Irene, uh, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Irenaeus (laughs) has a very difficult name to pronounce, but he was a person who lived around this time, and he said that Nicolaitans lived lives of unrestrained indulgence. Does that sound familiar? Clement of Alexandria said this, They abandon themselves to pleasure like goats, as if insulting the body, and they lead a life of self-indulgence. Sounds a lot like how some people in our culture live, just living like animals, doing whatever they please, um, whatever makes them happy or makes them feel good, that's how they live. And that's how people in our society live. And the people in Ephesus, in this church, they didn't accept that. There are some churches that will accept those kinds of uh, behaviors and won't, won't even just accept them, but they will celebrate them. The Word of God teaches that's not to be celebrated. That's to be laid off. Those kinds of behaviors are to be mortified. And that's what this, this church did. 
They were a work hard church. They were a die hard church. And they were a fight hard church. And that's great. Those things Jesus commends them for. I hope our church, Fellowship Baptist Church, is a church that serves the Lord in, in, in difficulty, in hardship. I hope our church is a diehard church full of people who are perseverant and people who are patient. I hope this church is a church who fights for the truth and for righteousness. But notice what Jesus says in verse 3 or verse 4. Nevertheless, they had a great start. They came out of paganism and they were transformed and they were new creations and they were off to a great start and they fought hard and they persevered and they worked hard and they served the Lord. But nevertheless, Jesus says, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. They had worked so hard for so many years. They had persevered for so long. They, have, they had fought so hard. But they had gotten to a point where they no longer had love for Jesus anymore. It was just out of duty. It was just out of devotion. Their love for their Savior had waned, had diminished, and Jesus says, you've left your first love. So what happens in the rest of this letter is that Jesus tells them how they can rekindle their relationship with God. So what we learn from this passage is how we, how you, how I can rekindle our relationship with God. Because sometimes we can be like the Ephesians. We can work hard. We can persevere and push through. And we can fight hard. But we can get to a point where that fire, that passion in our heart dwindles and dies down. So what do you do in that situation? How do you re respond? How do you react? Some of you might feel like you're there right now. Some of you can think back to a time in your life, in your testimony, when you were like that. Some of you are good right now, but someday in the future, you may get to a point where that fire and that passion in your heart dwindles down. What do you do? Number one, Jesus says he wants them to remember. Look at verse five. He says, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. He wants them to go back in their mind's eye and to think back to the time when they be first became a Christian. To think about the love they had for their Savior. To think about how overwhelmed they were at the fact that a holy, righteous God would forgive them of their sin. To think about how Jesus, who is all-powerful and almighty, came to this world and was born and found in fashion as a man, as Philippians says, and humbled himself, the king of the universe, the creator of all, the one who was above all, became a servant and was crushed for us. Paid the penalty of our sin, sacrificed himself on the cross. He wanted them to remember those thoughts and those feelings that they had early on in their relationship with him. I don't know if you ever think about what it was like when you were first a Christian. Remember how excited you were? Remember how you would sing with passion? Remember how it was like a whole new adventure for you? A whole new world. Everything, the old had gone and the new was come. Sometimes when I feel like my passion for God is waning. Sometimes what I do is I find old songs that I used to love when I was first a Christian. Um, I grew up listening to Stephen Curtis Chapman. I hope, I hope you don't uh, hate me now for <laughs> liking Stephen Curtis Chapman. Some people like him, some people hate him, but I loved him. 
I love listening to his music. And sometimes when I get to a spot where I, I just feel like I'm a, in a rut, I'll, I'll pull up some of his music. Or some of the songs that we used to sing when I was younger in youth group. I'll, I'll listen to those kinds of things, and it will remind me of what it was like when I was a teenager, when my passion for God was stronger than times when it's not. So I don't know what you do to remember those times, but Jesus tells us to take some opportunities, to take some time to remember and reflect on what it was like when you were first a Christian. Remember, he says, where you have fallen. And then he says, don't just remember. Number two, he says, repent. So remember, and now you need to repent. Those are some strong words, right? Jesus is telling a church who worked hard, who persevered and was patient, who fought hard. He's telling them they need to repent. Wow. Sometimes uh, we get to a point where we feel like we've done so much for God that we really have arrived. And there's no need for us to, to repent. There's no need for us to confess. When you get into that spot, look out. Be very, very careful. Because we all are sinners. None of us deserve what God has given us. And we all need to have times of repentance and confession. Later on, we're going to observe the Lord's table. And in those times, those are some times where we re really need to take stock of our lives. And we really need to repent. What does it mean to repent? Sometimes people think the word repent is talking about feelings. We get sorrowful. We get sad. We cry and we weep and we moan and we wail. But the word repent doesn't have uh, anything to do with emotions. It actually has something to do with our mind. Literally, the word repent means to change your mind. So sometimes you can repent without even shed, shedding a tear. Sometimes you can repent without being sorrowful. It's a mind thing. So what Jesus is telling them to do is to change their mind about their situation. This is a, a problem. This is a big deal. They can't go on like this. Something has to change. Their mind has to change. And so when we tell sinners to repent, whether they be Christian sinners or unchristian sinners, what are we asking them to do? We're asking them to change their mind. One of my favorite um, resources is uh, uh, an evangelistic resource called The Exchange. And in it, it talks about repentance. Uh, when you're talking to someone who uh, is, needs to get saved and you're explaining repentance, it's a changing of your mind. You need to change your mind about your sin, yourself, and your Savior. That's what the author says. What they were doing was sin. They were just going through the motions. They were not loving their Savior. Uh, their self, they needed to change their mind about their self. They thought everything was good. They were working hard. They were pushing through. They were persevering. But Jesus says, you've left your first love. And they needed to change their mind about their Savior. He is the one that they should have loved. So Jesus tells them, number one, to remember. Number two, to repent. And number three, he tells them to repeat. He says, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. When you remember what it was like early on in your relationship with Jesus. And you recall those things that you did in devotion to Him. He tells them, repeat those things. So that's why I sing those songs. Uh, some of us, we need to repeat the early works that we did as a, as a new Christian. One of the things that excites me most 
in my walk with the Lord is when I'm, I have the opportunity to see a young believer come to know Jesus Christ and to grow in Jesus Christ. So maybe that's what you need to do. Maybe those are the things that you need to do. What was it that you did early on in your relationship with Jesus that stoked that fire? Did you gather together with, with other believers regularly in church? Has that kind of slipped and, and slid? Well, you need to go back to that. Did you get together with other believers and, and pray and ask the Lord to help? Did you, did you fellowship with other believers? Did you soak in the worship and lift your hands and cry and meditate on what was being sung? What did you do? Most people who are counselors, uh, when they have a couple come to them that's having marital problems, the relationship isn't going well, what do they tell them to do? What do they say? Go on a date, right? You need to woo each other, just like you did when before you got married. You need to spend time with one another, not just any time, quality time. You need to go on a romantic getaway. You need to just sit there and talk with one another, right? Those are the kinds of things they'll tell couples who are struggling. And those are the same kinds of things that Jesus tells these people. They were to love him. Remember, they're his bride. The church is Jesus' bride, and we are to love him. We're to love him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. I really think that this church, they loved the Lord with their strength, but not with their heart, and not with their soul, and not with their mind. So, how do we rekindle the flame? Number one, we need to remember. Number two, we need to repent. And number three, we need to repeat. We're going to have a time as we uh, gather around the table uh, where we can reflect on our own hearts and we can take stock of our own lives. I'm not asking you to fall down onto your knees and to weep and wail and moan, but I am asking you, if you feel like you're in the same position as Ephesus, change your mind and figure out a plan for you to remember the first works what it was like when you first came to know Jesus Christ and to repeat those first works.